Hey, most of you, so don't really need to introduce myself, but for completeness sake, David Kozlicki, math department, Oregon State University. I'm going to be talking about Kamer classification of metagenomic samples. <clears throat> so the outline of the talk is as follows. First off, I'm going to talk about metagenomics and what is it. Who here has heard of metagenomics before? Huh? Do it, do it, do it. Okay, awesome. Some people did not raise their hand. Excellent. Good. So we'll, we'll talk about what metagenomics is, the problem that I'm attempting to solve. Um, talk about this uh, cool computational technique called containment minhash, and then we'll figure out a way to make it work for a bunch of different camera sizes simultaneously. And then I'm going to relate it back to this quantity called the average nucleotide identity, or ANI for short. Yeah. Okay. Can't hear me in the back? Excellent. Okay, sounds good. I, I can do that. Okay, let's start out in the beginning. Metagenomic classification. What is it? So metagenomic classification or metagenomic uh, analysis is a study of microbial communities from their sample DNA. So what does that mean? That means you have some sort of environmental sample like this guy right here. And it could be soil or air or water or human body site associated sample. And through some biochemical magic, you put it on one of these next generation sequencing machines right here. And as a pictorial representation, you have all the different genomes of all the different microorganisms that are floating around in that environmental sample. What the sequencer does is it shred these, th shreds these genomes and off of it, you get a whole bunch of short reads. Here I'm talking about whole genome shotgun metagenomic sequencing as opposed to 16S sequencing and uh, short read technology. So these things are like 150 base pairs, plus or minus, that kind of thing. And we end up with tens to thousands of gigabytes in size of these different short reads right here. And what we want to do is we want to try to figure out from these short reads right here, what organisms were actually in my sample? What genes belong to organisms that were in my sample? How much of each organism are in there? And what are these guys doing, like changing over time, etc. Any questions, please interrupt me. Okay, <clears throat> so the problem that I'm uh, wanting to solve with the metagenomic classification is as follows. We got all those reads floating around and <clears throat> we have about 10 million to 100 billion of these guys and I have this reference database. This database of known microbial genomes. They could be bacteria and viruses, uh, eukaryotes even. And these guys are nicely assembled whole genomes right here. And to date, we have about 60,000 microbial whole genomes right here. And what I want to try to figure out is which one of these actually shows up in my reads. And that's the metagenomic classification. So what I want to be able to do is get a vector of zeros and ones indicating this genome is in my sample, this one is not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Simply answering the question, who is in the sample? We can abstract this a little bit and <clears throat> use Kamers. So Kamer, that's a string of contiguous characters of length K. So like A, C, T, G, that's a former. So Kamer, string of length K. I can take all those reads that I had beforehand and look at all the Kamers or K length strings that were in all of those reads. Depending on the Kamer size that I pick, that will make the size of the set change. And so I might have 10 billion different Kamers. And if you use a really large Kamer size with a really big sample, you could end up with hundreds of trillions of different Kamers here. These are sets, so I'm not counting with repetition. It's just, does it show up in one of the reads or does it not? Each one of my reference database genomes as well, you can barely see it, but this is a smaller set representing all the Kamers inside of one of my reference genomes. And I can do that for all 60,000 of these guys right here. And now, instead of asking for presence or absence with a 0, 1 vector, I can ask how much do these sets overlap between each other. So for instance, is this little set right here, is it completely contained in this bigger set right there, or does it overlap by some appreciable amount? So one approach that people have done is using this thing called the Jacquard Index to be able to measure the size, the relative overlap between these sets. If the Jacquard index is large, that means that these guys overlap a whole lot. If it's small, they don't overlap. In fact, if it's zero, that means they don't overlap at all and there are no Kamers in common. I can be pretty confident that that reference genome is not actually in my sample if none of the Kamers are shared in common. <clears throat> 
Now this thing right here, to be able to calculate that, you can think of doing this in a very brute force fashion, right? You got all these cameras right here, this is in a big old list. You got all these cameras over here, this is in another big old list. And maybe you sort both of them and then you go down and you try to count the ones that are overlapping or shared in common or not. <clears throat> That's really, really slow, especially if you're dealing with 100 trillion elements right here. So one way that we could estimate this Jacquard index is by using this approach here called minhash. By the way, this talk here is an extension of the one that I gave last year. So that some of the people who were here last year, this might look familiar, but don't worry, I'll get to the new stuff in just a bit. <clears throat> I won't go into all the details of minhash. It's actually really cool the way that it works, but let me give you a broad high level perspective about what minhash tries to do. Okay, so the basic idea, you got all these cameras floating around. You take all those cameras and you randomly sample these guys. The way that you can randomly sample them is by using a hash function, hashing up all of these elements right here and taking the, uh, I don't know, n smallest hash values or the k-mers corresponding to the n smallest hash values. And that right there basically randomly subsamples all these k-mers right here and you can store that in a list. And you get a list of randomly sampled k-mers. This is really important and it's going to be the focus of this talk. This is called a sketch. A sketch size is how many you have sampled. So the length of this list right here, and it depends on the size of K, right? If K is bigger, these are going to be larger strings, etc. <clears throat> now, if you have another set of cameras like this guy, you can play the same game. You hash them all up, you randomly sample it and you get yourself another sketch. Now to estimate your Jacquard index, how much they overlap, you could count the fraction of k-mers in the sketches that are in common. So I can highlight in red the different ones that are shared in common right here. And the uh, number of reds over here over the total number right there, that is going to be an estimate for the Jacquard index. Why is this really fast? Because in practice, this sketch right here, you very sparsely sample it. You very sparsely sample it and you can prove results about how large the sketch is and how good your estimate is. In particular, if your Jacquard index is really big, so these two sets are basically identical, they overlap a whole lot, then this technique is going to work really well and going to give you a really good estimate. If, however, your sets don't overlap a whole lot, then this estimate is not so good because most likely you're going to be unlucky and the randomly sampled cameras that you pick aren't going to be in that intersection. So you're not going to be able to estimate Jacquard index as well when the Jacquard index is small. Unfortunately, for the problem that I was considering earlier, that's exactly the situation we're in. We had the metagenome cameras, a hundred trillion cameras, and then we had all the cameras in one of the reference organisms, maybe a few million. Uh few hundred trillion and a few million, yeah, the Jacquard index is always going to be really small. So Jacquard index is very small. Unfortunately, that means this approach here is going to give you a poor estimate in Jacquard index. All good for now? Question, yeah. The circle at the bottom, this is from the reference? This is sort of just the abstract idea. Yep, so just, you have two sets of cameras. Yep, exactly. You're correct that in practice, we have a small set right here and a really huge set down there. I just couldn't fit them both on the same slide. Yeah. <clears throat> yes? Ah, uh, they're not quite reads. So a read is a whole bunch of characters of A, C, C's, and G's. A camer is a substring of that. Ah, uh, it actually makes things a little bit simpler because that makes sure that everything is the same size. All of them are going to be length K, whereas my reads, they could vary a little bit, as well as it's lower dimensional. It's lower dimensional in that the number of dimensions that I have for my read is the same as the number of characters there, whereas for a camer, it's only K dimensional, basically. Yep. <clears throat> so it makes some things easier and it makes some things more difficult. Yes, I'm sampling to save time, exactly. Because to exhaustively compare these two, when I'm talking about billions of elements, it takes way too long. So you subsample and then compare, and this is ridiculously quick. Yep. Yeah? Can you sample, do you only sample once, or do you do like multiple random samples? 
So if you use one hash function and you take the smallest n of them, you've basically sampled n, right? Um, there are other ways that you could do it where you use a whole family of hash functions and just take one from each. But in practice, yeah, you just do it once. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I just remove cover? What's that? The, um, we can remove some informative camera because there are, there are present just one or two. Or ah. Just keep. Right, right, exactly. So <clears throat> the way that I presented it here, I have not been taking counts into consideration. But you're right, you could reduce the size of these sets right here by getting rid of the very low frequency camers. You could do that. However, then when you get up to camera sizes that are like k equals 55 or k equals 60, and most everything has count one, then you're like, oh, what do I do in that case? Yeah, yep. Okay, so can we do better? <clears throat> Containment min hash. So instead of asking what is the relative size of the overlap over the size of the union, what you could do is you could ask what percentage of my reference genome camers actually show up in my sample? What this does is it changes your denominator and it makes this quantity that used to be really small, not so small, and so easier to estimate. So basically, here's a more accurate pictorial representation. These are the camers of my metagenome. This is the camers of one of my reference genomes right here. And instead of looking at the green size over the red plus blue, what we can do is we can zoom in on this guy right here and just ask what is the relative size of the green versus this whole circle right here. That has a name and that's called the containment index, the size of the intersection over the size of your reference genome camers. <clears throat> so last time, I gave a talk on how to estimate this thing very accurately. The video is actually still up on YouTube if you, if you want to go see all the details, but I'll give you the really short Cliff Notes version of what we did in that one. So basically, to estimate this guy right here, once again, we don't want to exhaustively calculate it. We want to sample it, subsample it somehow so that we can compute these things quickly. So what we can do is we can put my entire metagenome here into a bloom filter. Who's heard of a bloom filter? A couple. Okay. Awesome. So for the rest of you guys, what a bloom filter is, on a very simple level, is just a data structure that allows you to do constant time set membership tests. I have a set. I turn it into a bloom filter, and I can say, is this element in my set by querying the bloom filter? And you can do that in constant time. And it also gives you a bit of a size reduction as well. Your whole set is sort of compressed down. What you have to pay for that is that sometimes you get false positives. It says, yes, this is in your set, when it actually wasn't. Cool thing is, it doesn't give you any false negatives. <clears throat> so we can put this guy into a big bloom filter right here. We randomly sample A, just like we did beforehand, and we get a sketch. So we get a sketch like this, and this is our sketch of A right here. And then all you do is you use this bloom filter to query <clears throat> and ask, is this camer? in my bloom filter? Is it in my metagenome? Go to the next one. Is it in my metagenome? Is it in my metagenome? And so you're going to get a whole bunch of yes, no's, yes, no's right here. If you take the fraction of yeses over the number of different camers that you were looking at, that there is going to give you an estimate of the containment index. So what do we do next? We have to prove that this thing works, make sure that the false positive rate of our bloom filter doesn't screw things up. You do that and you get some formulas that show you how close your estimate is to the true value and then it decays exponentially and it's all nice and good and everything like that. Easy to tell you, yeah, this is the classic Minhash approach. Jacquard indexes, they're small, so the relative error is going to be high. Whereas now with the containment index, we're estimating something that's a bit larger so my relative error is going to be a lot smaller. Question, Suki. This problem that you showed below, does that put in also the uh, the 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 sample from A or just 
just about when they moved Right. So this does take into consideration that you sampled. And the number of times you sampled here is uh, k times. Unfortunately, k mers and k's. Yes, we sampled k times. But you can see that it shows up right here. <clears throat> Yep. And the sampling error, and the sampling that in the uniform sampling from A. Bingo. Yep, exactly. And so you, as you can see right here, this is e to the minus, and this k right there. So if k is really big, you sample a whole lot, then your probability of deviating from the true value is exponentially small. It gets smaller. So it behaves in how we think it should. <clears throat> yeah? I have a question. Please do. Heard about metagenomics. I know what it is definition, but uh -huh. I don't understand. Uh, can you explain why uh, you? What is bad about just aligning every uh, time to? Because you have the reference. Absolutely. Why, why don't you do this? Because it is a person who doesn't know. But yeah. No, no. It's more obvious to do. Yes, that, that's a, a perfectly legitimate question. Uh, the main reason why is because my sample, my metagenome sample, contains so many reads. And there are so many different reference organisms as well. And so the complexity, you know, the computational complexity there is roughly like n squared. You can do some fancier stuff and make it a little bit better. But basically, it just takes way too long. Yeah. <clears throat> Another thing about this approach that we will see is that even if your reference database is incomplete, it can still give you some ideas, whereas alignment might miss out on it completely, depending on how you fill your pram alignment parameters. Yep. Yeah, but basically it's time. It's just too expensive. <clears throat> yep. Then you call the smash. C for containment. <clears throat> okay. So punchline with this containment index with a little bit of a fancy extra things like hyperlog log, you can turn this back into an estimate of the Jacquard index if you wanted to. And it turns out to be ac more accurate and faster than this minhash right here. And it lets you do some really cool things. So what if you did want to do the alignment approach? Then you could use this to facilitate that. How so? Well, and these ideas were explored in this particular paper. This is one with Sergey. Um, you have all these 60,000 reference genomes sitting over here. You can hash every single one of these guys and make your sketches. You make those sketches, the subsampling of KMERS right here. And then once you have your metagenome sample, you stick that in a bloom filter and you can identify which ones have large containment index. If they have large containment index, they probably show up in your sample. If that's small, they probably don't. So you can reduce this database down to the relevant organisms, the ones that actually have a chance of showing up in your sample. After that, now you're only talking about a few thousand genomes that you're aligning against. You can do that. So you could take BWA and you do your mapping, and then you handle the uniquely mapped reads and ones that are multi-mapped. You handle those probabilistically. You do some filtering. And then at the end of the day, you get one of these nice little pie charts that tell you Who's there? Into what relative abundance? Yeah. No, that's fine. Because it's the computer science literature. Yeah, it's 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 the same thing. If you're talking to a probabilist, yeah, yes, yeah. It is random subsampling. Yep. This all sounds fine, well, and good, but if you've ever worked with metagenomic data. You know that forming a bloom filter on a metagenome, that's, you actually get a really big data structure. It's really huge, and they're pretty slow to create. And the bad thing is, is that choosing the Kamer size, because remember, we're sticking Kamers into the bloom filter. If you change your mind and decide to use a different Kamer size, you have to rerun the whole process. And there are really no good methods to figure out what the right Kamer size is. There's some rules of thumbs and a few different estimates, but basically you just have to try a few. And so you're going to be making lots of these bloom filters, and they're going to be tens to hundreds of gigabytes in size. So not super efficient. <clears throat> so can we do even better? Can we do multiple Kamer sizes at once? OK. <clears throat> so can we bypass bloom filters, and can we somehow do multiple Kamer sizes at once? The thing that motivated this was this particular plot right here, and it shows the containment index versus Kamer size for a bunch of different 
genomes in comparison to a metagenome. So for instance, this little black line right here, that's a containment index as a function of K between my metagenome and my first reference genome. This line right here is the containment index as a function of K for my metagenome and my second reference genome like this. These are colored by whether or not those reference genomes are in the same genus as one that actually shows up in my metagenome. These guys right here, genome one and genome two, are of the same genus of something that actually shows up in my sample. And so the containment index decays a little bit more slowly. If you had something that was distantly related to your metagenome, like these guys down here, they're not even of the same genus of something in your sample, you can see that the containment index drops off really quickly. So these plots are really rather informative. It will help you better determine whether or not these particular genomes are actually represented in your metagenome or if they are not like this. So looking over multiple camera sizes is very informative. Let's see if we can do that. So what's the solution here? Use a ternary search tree. So a ternary search tree. <clears throat> what is this guy? Basically, it's another data structure that allows you fast, on average login, look up, insert, and delete search tree. So I'm assuming that not everybody here is intimately familiar with ternary search trees. Is that accurate? Yeah, okay. So let's go ahead and construct one for ourselves and see why we would want to use it in this particular case. So let's make a ternary search tree. I'm gonna insert a word into my ternary search tree. I'm gonna insert this word something. Well, my search tree is blank right here. So I insert it and I get an S-O-M, there we go. I got my word, my something stuck in here. Now, if I want to stick in another word like someone, the way you do it is as follows. You look at this first character. This first character matches, so you follow the arrow that has a little equal S. Yep, this S equals that S, so we move down to the O. That O matches this O, so we move to the M. M matches M, we move to the E. E matches there, so we move to the T. Oh, T does not match O, right? So we can't keep going down straight. So what do we do? We branch off. Last I checked, O comes before T in the alphabet. So let's branch off to the left, shall we? So <clears throat> O is less than T, so we branch off, and then we fill in the rest like this. Let's insert another word. How about the word somehow? Here again, the S-O-M-E, those all match. So I'm at this character right here. I compare the T and the H, well, H comes before T, so we move down this branch. H is not O, and H comes before O, so we branch off to the left again, and we stick it down here. Does this make a bit of sense? And we can answer something even completely different, like dog here, first character, doesn't match. So I branch off to the left again, and I go down. I realize this example doesn't have any right branching, but you can imagine that if you had a character that shows up after in the alphabet, you branch off to the right. That's why it's called ternary. You can equal, you can come before in the alphabet, you can come afterwards in the alphabet. Nifty thing about this is if you want to look up some element here, well, let's see if is dog in our ternary search tree. Well, D is not S, we move to the left, D, O, G, hey, look at that, yes. That is in our search tree, we're able to recover it. But now we can actually search something that we did not explicitly stick into our ternary search tree. For example, this prefix, this word sum. Well, S matches S, O matches O, M matches M, E matches E, and that's the end of the word. So what my ternary search tree has told me is that this word, sum, is a prefix to some word that is actually in this ternary search tree. So what does this thing give me? Not just a data structure to store elements, but also to allow you to do prefix lookups. Now, why is this important? How are we going to use this? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to use this to store those random subsamplings, those sketches that I was talking about. You have one of your microbial genomes. You get all the k-mers for some really large k. You got yourself this sketch right here. And you go ahead and you stick that into your ternary search tree. <clears throat> why do we do that? Because the really cool thing is all these prefixes are also in this tree and I can search on them. I can search on those prefixes. And the super big important key is the fact that all these long camers were random subsampling. If I just take their prefixes, it's still 
a random subsampling. I might have some duplicates, so it might be a less deep random subsampling, but these are random n-mers for some n less than k. And so you can see that if I take just the one, length one prefix, length two prefix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I get a random subsampling of k-mers for a whole span of k-mer sizes stuck in this tree right here. Yeah? So uh, this might be a problem in computer science, but um, how do you sample, how do you make sure you increase balance? So <laughs> the way that I represented it with uh, using the lexicographical ordering is probably very bad, especially when my alphabet is just A, C, T, and G. So I let people who are more deep into the construction of these things figure that out for me, and then I pull that package off the shelf and it works. Yes. <laughs> okay. You can repeat this for all your different reference genomes. So you take your other microbial genome, you get all its camers, you random subsample that guy, you stick that into your ternary search tree. <clears throat> Question? No, we have one TST to rule them all. Oh. So we, we sample all these camers, we stick it in the ternary search tree. Next genome, stick it in the same ternary search tree. Yeah, exactly. And the reason why I want to do that is because I can actually add little pointers on top of these camers and say which one of these microbial genomes did that guy come from? Yeah. The way you the way you describe construction. Yeah, so I, uh, it's, it's not quite the exact same as the suffix tree. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea of why I picked this is I just wanted prefix lookups to be fast. And it turns out for these, this camera size problem, it's actually a rather small data structure. So it just worked best. For this particular guy. In general, anything that allow you to do prefix or suffix lookups quickly would work. Yep. So what are we going to do with this? Let's take that ternary search tree right here. I have now taken all my reference database organisms, all 60,000 of them. I have sketched all of them and I've stuck them all into the same ternary search tree. And now I can take my metagenome reads right here and I can stream it through this ternary search tree once. What does stream mean? Stream means basically I don't have to read the whole thing in memory and I have to pass over it just once. Just like a pipe in Linux. I can just pipe my metagenome through this ternary search tree right here. And then for every single one of these reads, I take its first character, first two, first three, first four, like that, do the whole sliding window. And I ask, are any of those guys show up as prefixes? of some camer that's in my ternary search tree. If it does, tell me which genomes it came from. And if I do that, I get the containment index for k equals one, two, three, four, all the way up to k, all at once. All containment indexes for all camer sizes, up to whatever original k you picked. So this is cool. This basically allows you to come up with plots like this. <clears throat> and this is easily parallelizable, right? You can just one core per k size, basically. And you get these plots of the containment index versus a function of camera size right here. So fantastic. We can easily reproduce those plots, that red and black plot that I showed you earlier on. <clears throat> Questions about that? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go for it. But the reference database is uh, a lot of really long reads, faster files, I don't know, 90 KB, I don't know how Yeah, whole genomes, it. yep. So, and, but where do you get, I understand how you get sketches from the short read sequence, but how do you get sketches from the long? Same thing, you take all substrings of length K, that right there is going to be a set of all K-mers that show up in that genome. So the one sketch will be one genome? Yes. Yeah, one sketch per genome. What if you take a piece which is repetitive in many bacterial genomes, then you lose them? Since you randomly subsample, usually you won't be picking up the same one in each one every time. Yeah, I have two more questions. So, Ilan, yeah. So, uh, 
seems like you can get out of that information just by using a very large K, right? You don't you really need to introduce the entire line. You don't know at which, in which level of uh, kind of subgenetic relationship your actual Absolutely. That's what we do want, right? And before the next five slides, there is no way to relate what, how the Kamer size relates to the containment index relates to phylogenetic distance. But we're going to recover that. We will. I think my question is more basic. If you use large enough K yep. to get all the information you need, you really need to again, get that information from the smaller K. Right. The thing is, a priori, you don't know what large enough K is at all. And so the only way to figure out how large enough K is is to sample a bunch of them, right? We know that probably it's going to be 20 or higher, but is 20 sufficient, 30, 40, 50, 60? You don't know. And I have examples of different metagenomic samples from different environments where different camera sizes is big enough. In other ones, it's not big enough. Right. Why not just get, I, I guess. Yes, the reason why is because that maximum that I'm going to pick is something ridiculous like 100. And if you were to just look at 100, all these lines here are going to be down at zero. And it's going to be completely uninformative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, your PST is shorter than the Rotary job? Yes, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> the, reason why, the reason why it is is because the bloom filter is formed off of my metagenome, whereas my TST is just from my reference database. And um, the construction time is, the construction time for your TST is in N log N? The in, uh, creation time? Yeah. Um, so it is, uh, you have to stream over all your data once, so it is linear in the construction. But thankfully, these are the reference genomes, so they're relatively small. Yep. And it's offline. You do it once. Yeah. Yeah. Good question, though. OK. So boop -a -doop -a -doo, we can get one of these guys. <clears throat> Thanks. So now, can we get some sort of evolutionary information from these particular curves right here? So we have plots that look like this. <clears throat> we have a bunch of different reference genomes. And using this ternary search tree, I can now get these curves, and they look like this. Now, if you were to stare at this, it's pretty clear that genome one is definitely in my metagenome. Because at a bunch of different Kamer sizes, every single one of its Kamers shows up in my metagenome. So most likely it's actually in there. But what about this purple line or this red line? Who's to say that this one is in and that one's out? Or maybe it's because this reference genome is closely related to something in my metagenome, but not exactly the same. So can we tease apart this sort of evolutionary relationship? Can we predict the relatedness of these guys to my metagenome from these curves? <clears throat> to be able to do this, we're going to have to model it, figure out how related a reference genome is to the metagenome. So what are we going to do? <clears throat> we're going to set this aside for half a second. And I'm going to talk about a probabilistic model. So when I was talking about MinHash earlier, and I gave this reference right here for MASH, they did have a probabilistic model, but it was much more simple. And it was not as a function of k. So it wasn't exactly what we wanted. So we're going to have to do something slightly different. We are going to model a site-wise Bernoulli process. What does that mean? You give yourself a whole genome right here, and independently, at every character, you flip a coin. And if it, this coin is heads, you leave that character alone. If you, the coin is tails, then you change it uniformly randomly to something else. Now your coin is weighted, and it's biased towards heads or towards tails, towards mutate or towards don't mutate. And that bias, whether you mut mutate a character or you don't mutate a character, that's this mutation rate, P. This is playing the role of my average nucleotide identity. Reminding you that, guys, that average nucleotide identity is if you took two genomes and you could align them perfectly and you counted the number of matches over the, all the mismatches, that right there is the average nucleotide identity. So this P right here, this mutation rate, is playing the role of the average nucleotide identity. So with a whole bunch of math that I'm not going to go into details, I can prove this particular formula right here. For this mutation process, 
the expected containment index between my reference genome and my metagenome is given by this big old ugly formula right here. That has things to do with the uh, number of kamers, with some count i, and the number of kamers in your genome, and stuff like that, blah, 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 blah. The only important thing here is, this was our metagenome? It doesn't show up on the right-hand side at all. What does that mean? The shape of these curves are determined entirely by properties of your reference genome, not your metagenome. So when you go and you decide to pre-compute all these ternary search trees, you could simultaneously figure out what the shape of these curves are going to be for every single one of your reference genomes right here. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if you have a reference genome that's all A's, your containment curve is going to look very different than if your reference genome was uniformly random, right? It depends almost entirely or entirely according to this formula on your reference genome. Yeah? It must have missed something. So it has to somehow depend on, on your metagene, right? If, if there is something related in that metagene, what is that? Right, so this, this right here, again, why I'm, I'm skipping over a whole bunch of details right here, but basically this says that <clears throat> if a genome is in your metagenome, that is a realization of a Bernoulli process yeah. with parameter P, then you get this. Yeah. So, that's yeah. really, so it's conditioned on you having something related to your process. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so what's the punchline of this? What does this allow us to do? Well, if we bring back this graph of the containment curves, from the shape of these guys right here, you can actually then go and figure out what your mutation rate was. So instead of just writing genome one through genome five, you can associate the average nucleotide identity with these guys. So this curve right here, using that formula, means that something is in my metagenome with a 99.95 ANI. So like, the same thing or maybe a very closely related strain. This guy down here, this is at 80 ANI, 80% ANI. So it's probably a different species. My metagenome probably contains a different species than this particular reference genome right here. It's pretty cool. From these containment curves right here, I can figure out how related my reference genomes are to my metagenome. Nice thing is, this gives you a nice easy way to threshold your uh, metagenomic samples. So oftentimes when you're doing like um, taxonomic profiling, you get this really long tail of really small low abundance organisms in there as well. And sometimes it's not so clear where you should cut that off and say that's just noise and it's zero. This is nice because it gives you a way to do your cutoffs by using a very biologically interpretable, interpretable quantity, average nucleotide identity. I want to ignore any organisms that are 80% ANI or less because it's a different species. And you can set your threshold right there, cut everything else off. So that's kind of cool. But what do I actually want to do with this? What I think would be cool to try to do as a next step is use this for the targeted assembly of distantly related organisms. What do I mean by that? I take all my reads, I do this whole smash thing and the ternary search trees and the average nucleotide identity, et cetera, et cetera. And I can figure out which reads are of known origin. That is, they come from genomes that are 80% or higher average nucleotide identity to something in my reference database. So these are the known knowns, right? Reads of known origin. The rest of them are going to be reads of unknown origin. So nothing in my database is related at closer than 80% average nucleotide identity. So these are novel, these are somewhat new. And so it'd be cool is to figure out if there's some way that you could then take this dark matter as they call it, because you don't know what it is, and try to do something like assemble it. And of course, I don't think this naive approach is going to work because you're gonna to have to do a little bit of data integration because these reads of known origin, 
there's a lot of horizontal gene transfer going on here, so your assemblies would probably be very fragmented. But in any case, it'd be really cool as a tool to be able to separate what you know and what you don't know in a metagenome. Excellent. Last five minutes. This average nucleotide identity model is not in the code, but if you want to check out the code, it's up there. You get some other tools for free, like a contig binner. <clears throat> Um, it's all written in, in uh, Python, and I'm a mathematician, not a computer scientist, and so it could definitely use some speed improvements. But in any case, containment minhash allows you to quickly compute this uh, containment uh, coverage index, allows you to do multiple camera sizes at once, you stream your metagenome through just once, no bloom filters needed, very low and um, not super memory intensive. I've ran it on a real metagenome with 30,000 reference genomes on my MacBook Air. Since everything is streaming, you don't need a lot of RAM. <clears throat> and you can uh, relate it using this model of molecular evolution to average nucleotide identity. More info, you can check out my website. Uh, there's a paper up. The really cool thing about that paper is if you go to the associated GitHub page, you can, it's actually completely reproducible. So if you wanted to, you can tweet, uh, fiddle with the different parameters and all the plots update and all the numbers update and all that kind of fun stuff so you can really understand what's going on here. But in any case, the rest of the code is up there on GitHub and thanks for your attention. <clears throat>yeah, exactly. It's, it's completely dependent on the environment and what reference database you're using. So for example, if you are using the NCBI reference database, that's biased towards humans quite a bit. And if you use a human body site associated sample, then you're going to not get a whole lot of unknown stuff. Probably the stuff that you're going to get unknown are going to be things like viruses and eukaryotes if you forgot to throw that into your reference database. That kind of thing. Once you move to soil samples, ooh, there a vast majority of reads are actually of unknown origin, which is really cool because cool things come out of soil metagenomes like CRISPR and all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> yep. Yes. Say again. Ah, uh, repetitive. <clears throat> Right, so do, 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 do these reads of known origin? Yeah, that kind of gets at the issue that I was saying that if you did this naive approach, you'd end up with a fragmented assembly because there could be repetitive elements that are shared everywhere. Not just repetitive er elements, but how about conserved elements like 16S conserved regions that can be shared over a bunch of different bacteria. So yes, if you wanted to do this particular approach right here, you have to be a little bit more careful. But yeah, good observation. <clears throat> and a one, then a two. Um, did you plan to integrate uh, Tenix data in Parker? Integrate which data? Tenix data. Because with Tenix data, we have a uh, long uh, sequence mm -hmm. cut uh, in little in little read, but they are the um, same, um, uh, beginning of it, uh, same prefix. Mm -hmm. So you can know, okay, all, all this will come from same long molecules. Mm -hmm. So I. If one is assigned to uh, one uh, genome, probably you know, if majority of it are assigned to a genome, all reads of this of this uh, long molecules is assigned to the to the genome, so we can use it for uh, better vaccination. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, unfortunately, I have not had a chance to play with long read data before, and I would really love to. So if you have some and we could play around with it, definitely be interested in that. Yeah. <clears throat> The one parameter that I didn't see think about optimizing was the size of the sample you take out of the reference genomes. Yes. Is that something you have to optimize? Nope. So those, those are the details that I skipped way back or yonder. Here. <clears throat> so in the containment minhash paper, there are a bunch of formulas like this that quantitatively relate how good your estimation is to the different parameters that you use, like the number of samples that you take, yeah. what the size of the containment index is, 
And then you don't see it here, but stuffed in this little delta here is the error rate of like the bloom filter in this case. But a lot of these formulas right here hold through. They're on a piece of paper in my bag, but they're not actually in a paper yet because the ternary search tree stuff is new. But in any case, yes, you can come up with formulas like this that exactly tell you the uh, trade-offs. Yep. <clears throat> cool. I don't want to eat into Sagi's time anymore. So I'll thank you guys and take any other questions offline, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Cool.